Continuing on with graphing polynomial and rational inequalities, in the last video we saw what we're actually going to be doing. We're going to be identifying where our graph is above and below the x-axis. That's all we're doing in solving polynomial inequalities. So we saw a, a simple example here. So let's go ahead and let's figure out the formal steps to be solving these, and then we'll be working through more examples. So the formal steps are just like solving an equation. The very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to move everything to one side so that on the other side we have zero. Now, I put the inequality of less than here, but this holds true for any of them. Less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. So we set it up just like we're going to be solving an equation. And then you notice in step two, we actually treat it just as an equation. We, we kind of change our inequality into an equal sign just for this step, though. So don't change it forever. It just changes for this step. We find those solutions, and those solutions are going to give us our boundary points. What does that mean? Okay, let me go back to my last example here, and let me try and get rid of some of these. Notice my graph switches between above and below my x-axis at this point right here and at this point right here. Basically, my x-intercepts. So my x-intercepts are going to be my boundary points where it switches between above and below my x-axis. So that's what step number two basically identifies for us is our x-intercepts. Then we're going to take those boundary points and we're going to put them on a number line, which is in essence the same thing as our x-axis. And we're going to test the intervals in those number lines to see whether it's positive or negative, to see whether it is positive, meaning above the x-axis, or seeing whether it's negative or below the x-axis. And that's going to tell us what exactly what we're looking for. So that tells us our actual answers. If we're looking for above, we look for the positive values. If we're looking for below, then we're looking for the negative values. And we can answer these in either interval or set builder notation. If it doesn't specify, you can use either. If it does specify, make sure you use the notation that it actually asks you to use. And then if you're doing interval notation, then you would be including the endpoints if your inequalities include the greater than, meaning your interval would include the brackets rather than the parentheses. Okay, so let's see an example of us working through these steps here. So our very first step that we want to do is we want to get zero on one side. Now, in equations, most of us probably felt more comfortable putting our polynomial expression on the left-hand side, which leaves the zero on the right-hand side. But it didn't really matter. We could have done it either way. That kind of holds true for here. I kind of more suggest the same thing, putting the expression on the left-hand side and the zero on the right-hand side. But if it's more natural to you to do it the other way, that's fine. I would suggest that you flip the whole thing around before you try to identify what your appropriate solutions are. Okay, so what we want to do here in this specific example is we want to simplify this expression with leaving the zero, hopefully on the right-hand side. Before I start moving things around, I need to simplify the left-hand side of my equation, and I just do that by distributing my 3x, gives me 3x squared minus 3x, if we were trying to solve an equation, we would definitely make note that this was a quadratic or degree two, and that would definitely identify that we need to set this equal to zero. Same thing here. We need to set this equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract 10 to move my 10 to the left and add 2x to move my 2x to the left. Simplifying this, this gives me 3x squared minus x minus 10. And that leaves me with less than or equal to zero. Okay, um, quadratic equation, we can solve it by factoring quadratic formula, completing the square, whatever is most natural to you. I always prefer factoring. I think it's the easiest or shortest method. So let's see if this one factors. My outside, if I put a negative, gives me negative 6x 
plus 5x gives me a negative x in the middle. And it looks like that also would give me a negative 10 back there. So this one does factor. Now I can treat this as 3x plus 5 times x minus 2 is equal to 0 only for this step. Don't lose the less than or equal to part because that's going to give us what the actual answer is going to be. So if this was equal to 0, I would set each part equal to 0, and that would give me the solution of negative 5 thirds and x equals 2. Now, these give me my x-intercepts if I were to graph it, and I will do that at the end to double check it. But these also give me those boundaries that I was talking about in my steps here. This tells me where the graph switches between above and below the x-axis. Of course, they're the x-intercepts. So what I'm going to do with these then is I'm going to put them on a number line, which is equivalent to the x-axis, and I'm going to test the interval between these boundaries. So I put my boundaries on a number line, of course, in numerical order, because that is what a number line does. So notice here I have three intervals. I have an interval here, an interval here, and an interval there. So I need to select a number in between those three intervals, and you can pick any number that you wish to pick. We're going to plug that into our equation. We want to plug it into the one where it has zero on one side. So you might think that you plug it into this one here, which is perfectly fine, but it actually is going to be even easier if we plug it into the factored one, and I'll explain why here in a second. So we plug it into this here to see whether it's positive, and that's going to tell us our graph is above the x-axis, or whether it's negative to tell us whether our graph is below the x-axis. So we're at the point that we need to pick our actual x values in our intervals, and we need to plug them into our expressions to determine whether they're positives or negatives. So I like to organize this in a table. I think it keeps things nice and neat. Over here on the left, it's going to designate what x value you specifically put. Here in the middle, it's going to show you the work that you actually do. Again, you can plug it in in any expression, but I think it's always easiest to plug it into the factored expression. So that's what I'm going to do here is write my factored expression. And then on the right, we just need to select whether we come up with a positive or negative. Positive meaning above the x-axis, negative meaning below the x-axis. Okay, so our interval on the left, we need something less than negative 5 thirds. Now, negative 5 thirds is negative 1 and 2 thirds. So you can pick any value less than negative 1 and 2 thirds. So you could pick negative 2, you can pick negative 10, you can pick negative 500. It doesn't matter as long as it's less than negative 5 thirds. I'm going to pick negative 3. And between negative 5 thirds and 2, again, any value between them, I'm going to pick 0. Anytime it switches between a negative value and a positive value, I always suggest 0 because it's super easy to work with. Beyond 2, anything larger than 2 works, so I'll pick 5. But you can pick 3, 5, 287. It doesn't matter as long as it's larger than 2. All right, let's take these x values and plug them into our expression. So first, 3 times negative 3 plus 5 times negative 3 minus 2. Now, I can work out actual numerical values here, but I don't need to. All I need to figure out is if this is positive or negative. So I'm going to look at each factor individually and determine if each of those are positive or negative. So on the left, 3 times negative 3 gives me negative 9. Negative 9 plus 5 gives me negative 4. So I'm just going to say that I come up with a negative over here. On the right, negative 3 times negative 2 gives me negative 5, or all I need to know is that it's negative. Then I multiply these two values because that's what my factoring says. If I were to multiply these, I would come up with this expression. So I could plug them in this expression here, 
But since I'm only looking for positives and negatives, it's going to make our life a lot easier by plugging it into the factored expression. So now all I have to do is say negative times negative gives us a positive value. So that means over here on the left, to the left of negative 5 thirds, it's positive, or it's above the x-axis, or that it is greater than zero at this point. Now, since our expression is looking for less than zero, that means this interval would not be part of our solution. All right, in the middle, I plug zero into my factored expression. Again, I'm only looking for positive and negative. Three times zero is zero. Zero plus five is five, so I get a positive here on the left. Zero minus two is negative. Positive times negative gives us negative. So here in the middle, we get a negative, which tells us that it is below the x-axis, which tells us our inequality is actually less than zero. So that's going to be a solution because that's what we're looking for. All right, in the last one, we're plugging in five. So three times five plus five and five minus two. Both of these, if I were to work out the math, would give me positive value. Positive times positive gives me a positive. So a positive here, which is above my x-axis, which tells us that I'm greater than zero. So we've done all the work at this point. Now all we need to do is see what our inequality is actually asking for. So we've already said that this inequality is looking for less than zero. So we're looking for any place that we see negative, because negatives are, of course, less than zero. Well, that interval that's less than zero is between these two values here, between negative 5 thirds and 2. So my answer is going to be all the values between negative 5 thirds and 2. So this is my interval notation. Now, since this is equal to, less than or equal to zero, then that means I will include my endpoints. So negative 5 thirds is included and 2 is included. And so all values between negative 5 thirds and 2 will make this expression less than or equal to 0. Okay, if you want to graph this and double check this, which I always encourage you to do so, what we want to do is we want to plug in our part where we have it set equal to, or in this case, inequality opposite of zero. So I'm going to plug in 3x squared minus x minus 10 into my graph. Okay, so I have my original graph here, y equals 3x squared minus x minus 10. We are looking for specifically where it is below the x-axis. And so if I were to highlight that for you, that would give you this here. And let me, there we go. We can see it a little better than if I change it to that moon. So we can see that where this blue part is, that's the answer that we actually want. So if I were to shade my actual interval that we selected, we selected between negative 5 thirds and 2. And so let me go ahead and select that here. So notice this green shading. And so maybe in this window you can see it a little bit better. But this green shading is representing all of our x values that will make our inequality true. So all of the x values that start here, which we've already designated as negative 5 thirds, and so I can select that to you, negative 1 and 2 thirds, all the way up to this point right here, which is 2, 0. And so anything in that green shaded region or anything between those two values designates where our graph is below the x-axis, or where our graph is less than or equal to zero. And so this has just confirmed that we came up with the correct answer in our actual algebraic work. We've just confirmed it a couple of different visualizations with the graph. And we're just going to keep working more examples.